While it's hard to imagine now, there was a time when superhero movies weren't trendy and were generally considered to be absolute trash. With a few exceptions, such as the Tim Burton Batman films or Superman, comic book films shared a similar perception to what video game films currently hold. But thanks to a new wave of comic book adaptations in the 2000s, this perception was changing, and the most prominent of the early 2000s films was the web crawler himself, Spider-Man. The 2002 Spider-Man was the first film ever to break $100 million in sales on its opening weekend. It was so successful, it grossed more than both Star Wars Episode II Attack of the Clones and Lord of the Rings The Two Towers also released that year. Multiple sequels were planned and it proved just how successful a comic book property could be on the big screen. With the release of Venom on October 5th, let's take a look at the entire history of Spider-Man films from the late 70s to present day. And if you don't know about the Spider-Man of the late 70s, you are in for a treat. What's up guys, I'm Dave Klein, and this is the History of Spider-Man Films. But first, make sure to subscribe to Games by Universe for more on comic books and film history. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out our video on the history of the Predator. When Spider-Man was first introduced as a one-off in the final installment of the original Amazing Fantasy run back in 1962, the iconic hero was an immediate success. With its sales rivaling other Marvel top sellers, after this single issue, Spider-Man was given his own comic series, The Amazing Spider-Man, which would become one of Marvel's most popular series. With his soaring popularity, Spider-Man quickly gained an animated series back in 1967. Spider-Man, Spider-Man. Does whatever a can. Which is also where all the amazing Spider-Man memes come from. Fasten your seatbelts! Thank you, Spider-Man 1960s, for all you have given us. While Superman had earned himself a live-action spot on television back in 1952, and Batman found his live-action place in 1966, it wasn't until the 1970s that Marvel would finally find their comic book characters in the live-action primetime spotlight with... Spidey Super Stories. Who would do anything so cruel? Spoil somebody's lunch by giving him a rubber glove sandwich and spoil a dog's morning walk by not letting him near a hydrant. And yes, that is Morgan Freeman as the narrator. These sketches showed up on the 1970s children's television series The Electric Company and appeared occasionally from 1974 to 1977, and it was around this time Spider-Man would finally find himself starring in a made-for-TV film simply titled Spider-Man. I'm not saying the effects were great, nor the action, really. I don't get why he had to jump up and climb around the villains just to start fighting them anyways. But hey, this was technically the first Spider-Man film. While the made-for-TV film was meant to serve as a pilot for an upcoming TV series, outside of the United States, it did see a theatrical release. This made-for-TV film was so successful for CBS, it ended up being the best performing production CBS had the entire year, leading to production on a full TV series. Full disclosure, CBS is the parent company of GameSpot. Wink. In spite of its success and popularity, Stan Lee wasn't a fan, and in an interview for Pizzazz Magazine in October 1978, he stated, They've been treating the TV Spider-Man as a cardboard character, too juvenile. While the show was eventually cancelled by CBS, various two-part episodes were re-edited and turned into feature-length films outside the US. The first being Spider-Man Strikes Back in 1978, and the second being Spider-Man The Dragon's Challenge in 1981. Meanwhile, also outside the US, another Spider-Man property was being licensed out to Toei in Japan. Similar to the American Spider-Man show, this was primarily a TV show. However, it did also contain a live-action film released theatrically in 1978. While Spider-Man contains many of the same abilities, outside of that, the show and film are in no way similar to the original comics. Spider-Man! 
In a Japanese show, Spidey gets his abilities from an alien. We see Spider-Man fighting Kaiju and racing along in an alien spaceship similar to a sports car that can not only fly, but also turn into a giant robot for fighting these Kaiju. And believe it or not, Spider-Man piloting this giant mech, Leopardon, actually served as an influence on Super Sentai and what would become Power Rangers in the United States. While Super Sentai was initially released before Spider-Man, back in 1975, it lacked the aspect of the characters controlling a giant mech. It wasn't until after the popularity of Spider-Man's transforming Leopardon that Toei would decide to introduce this aspect to more of their shows, including Super Sentai. With the conclusion of these series, it would be decades until the next film installment of the Web Slinger, but not for lack of trying. In 1985, Canon Films purchased the rights to Spider-Man for a period of five years, with a contract stating they had until this period expired to create a film. The first screenplay written for Canon featured Peter Parker mutating into an eight-legged arachnid and was more akin to Wolfman. Understandably, Stan Lee hated it and wanted rewrites. Screenwriters Ted Newsom and John A. Brancato were hired on to write a new adaptation, and this time kept it far closer to the original source, pitting Spider-Man against Dr. Octopus. With further rewrites, the film was budgeted at around $20 million. But in the end, Canon was folding and couldn't provide the budget necessary. In 1989, Canon chief Menahem Golan pre-sold the uncreated film with Viacom taking the television rights and Columbia Pictures taking the home video rights. Canon was bought out, and Golan left to head 21st Century Film Corporation, bringing along the rights to Spider-Man, which he extended into January 1992. Further rewrites were issued before the rights were sold once again, this time to an independent film studio, Carol Co. Famed director James Cameron was hired on, who created a scriptment, or hybrid treatment, a script, which he claimed was based solely on reading the comics without having looked at any of the prior scripts. This time around, Peter Parker had some vast differences from the comic book version. His web shooters became a biological part of his body, he was morally ambiguous, sometimes violent, reveals himself to Mary Jane near the finale, and the two would have sex on the Brooklyn Bridge. He also has lines like the following. <clears throat> I'll kill you, motherfucker! You hear me? You're dead, you sick <laughs> While Stanley was on board with this version, as it turned out, Marvel had sold overlapping rights to various companies. Not only that, but Golan was upset by a contract Carol Co. had drafted for James Cameron. This led to multiple lawsuits, companies suing each other, and other companies counter-suing. Oh, also in 1996, Carol Co., 21st Century, and Marvel all went bankrupt. In other words, it was a total clusterfuck. Fast forward to 1998, and the court ruled Marvel's original contract with Golan had expired, and therefore Marvel now had the rights to Spider-Man, which they then licensed to Columbia Pictures. After a dispute with MGM over the rights to Spider-Man and James Bond, the two companies traded, and finally, in 2000, a full 15 years later, a new theatrical Spider-Man film went into production. For Columbia Pictures' version, David Coop was hired to write the screenplay, who primarily based his version off of the James Cameron scriptment. Green Goblin was chosen as the villain, and after various directors were considered, Sam Raimi, who at the time was known primarily for the Evil Dead series, was ultimately chosen. Many considered this a baffling choice at the time, considering his prior works. Yet more rewrites on the script were handled, this time by Scott Rosenberg, who added more action sequences and a dialogue touch-up by Alvin Sargent. Tobey Maguire was chosen to play Peter Parker, with Kirsten Dunst cast as Mary Jane Watson. Tally ho. Spider-Man's costume was created using two different outfits, as well as CG for certain scenes. The first outfit was a full one-piece bodysuit, while the second had a separate mask and was used specifically for scenes when Parker would take his mask off. In 2001, building up to the release of the film, Sony put out a teaser trailer featuring a helicopter being pulled into Spider-Man's webbing in between the towers of the World Trade Center. However, after the events of 9-11, this trailer was recalled. Finally, in 2002, with an estimated budget of $139 million, Spider-Man's first true theatrical film was released to U.S. theaters and made to spectacular results. It became the first film ever to earn over $100 million in sales on its opening weekend, 
and worldwide would earn over $800 million, becoming the highest grossing superhero film at its time, only to eventually be stripped by that title worldwide by Spider-Man 3 in 2007 and domestically by The Dark Knight in 2008. Critics and viewers alike were enamored with the live-action adaptation, with it being nominated for multiple awards, including the Academy Awards for sound design and visual effects. It also won the MTV Award for Best Kiss. Make out with me, you will. Which we all know is the most important award of all. The final version showcases Peter Parker's origin story as he becomes Spider-Man, from first being bitten by an experimental, genetically designed super spider, which, if it weren't Spider-Man, that phrase would sound absolutely horrifying. To going through the mutation of becoming Spider-Man, and finally the guilt of allowing a robber to escape after a robbery who would end up murdering his Uncle Ben. As a kid, it resonated with a fantasy I dreamed would happen to me. Except for that I hate spiders, so maybe I'm not the best candidate. It also contains one of the best Spider-Man quotes from Uncle Ben. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. This quote came from the very first Spider-Man comic as part of a narrative text box in the final panel of the first issue. It was only later retroactively attributed to Uncle Ben. Thanks to the success of Spider-Man, Tobey Maguire, who had been acting his entire life and had previously starred in films like Pleasantville and The Cider House Rules, became synonymous with the role. The film's major success, along with the recently released X-Men film, is often attributed with revitalizing the superhero genre within films. With its major success, a sequel to the film was immediately put in the works with Sam Raimi once again at the helm, but this time with Alfred Goff and Miles Miller penning the first version. Eventually, after multiple rewrites, Alvin Sargent wrote the final version, with Sam Raimi stating the story was influenced by the Spider-Man comic books, and he may have also been partially influenced by his love of Superman 2. But not all was good, and in particular with the new star Tobey Maguire. Tobey Maguire sustained a back injury, and this is when everything gets a little murky. Rumors floated that this was caused during the filming of Seabiscuit, the film Tobey Maguire acted in between the first two Spidey flicks. According to this rumor, Maguire then tried to utilize this injury to secure more money in the sequel, with his publicist issuing the statement, After doing two physically demanding films in a row, Toby has experienced mild discomfort in his back, which is in the final stages of healing. With an April 12 start date around the corner, everyone involved wants to be certain he's able to do the intense stunts. Again, still according to rumor, Jake Gyllenhaal was allegedly considered to replace Tobey Maguire, apparently meeting with the Spider-Man 2 producers on set. After being told he was fired, Maguire allegedly begged for his job back. On the other hand, according to Tobey Maguire, none of this was true. In an interview with IGN, he states, It's not true that I was fired. Basically, I had some concerns as did the studio because the level of stunts are so much greater on the second picture. He also claimed his back injury was an on and off issue unrelated to Seabiscuit, and his utilizing his injury for a higher salary was an invention of a journalist. Either way, Tobey Maguire was back on for the sequel, and filming commenced with a 2004 release date. The film included all the elements seen in the 50th issue of The Amazing Spider-Man, like Parker ditching the costume as it interferes too much with his personal life, something he simply doesn't have while being the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. However, it added Doc Ock as the main villain, who turns into a homicidal maniac after Chimp and Plant and on his neurologically linked bionic limbs break. On witnessing Mary Jane get engaged to J. Jonah Jameson's son, John Jameson, Peter Parker becomes depressed and loses his powers, causing him to focus on his personal life. And look, I know everybody loves this film, but I've never been a fan of Spidey losing his powers due to losing his mojo. It's just never been my favorite choice for this. When Dr. Octopus threatens Mary Jane and captures her, Peter Parker finds his powers returning and goes after Doc Ock, resulting in one of my favorite scenes from the movie, where he heroically puts his body at risk to save a trainload of New York citizens with his mask coming off in the process. For the first time, his secret is revealed to the public who vow to keep his secret. He's just a kid. No older than my son. I don't think a 28-year-old Tobey Maguire looks like a kid here, but let's just roll with it. In the end, he stops Doc Ock and his secret is revealed to Mary Jane, who ends up ditching her soon-to-be husband on their wedding day to be with him. Look, I'm just saying, on re-watching the film, she's kinda not a great person and treats John Jameson like dirt. Similar to Spider-Man 1, Spider-Man 2 is a major success both critically and in the box office. It's still revered as one of the top superhero movies of all time, despite my personal issues with it. And its success earned it yet another sequel in the form of Spider-Man 3. 
This time, the screenplay was penned by Sam Raimi, his brother Ivan Raimi, and once again, Alvin Sargent. Harry Osborn, who was featured in both Spider-Man 1 and 2, would have his story conclude, and Sandman was going to be the new villain. Raimi wanted another villain, initially looking at the Vulture, but was convinced by producer Avi Arad to instead use the popular 90s villain Venom. He at first disagreed, but eventually came around to the idea, stating at a Comic-Con panel, I have been objecting to the lack of humanity in Venom, and in studying him, I gained an appreciation for him. Venom has always been a character that fans love, and that's why he's here. Spider-Man 3 was released in 2007, which explored Peter Parker discovering his Aunt May was actually killed by Flint Marco, who would later become the Sandman through a freak accident. Sandman was presented as a sympathetic villain who was trying to gather cash to pay for an operation to save his dying daughter. Harry Osborn, who discovered Peter Parker with Spider-Man in the second installment, takes up the mantle of Green Goblin to kill Peter in revenge. Peter Parker, in the meantime, has let the popularity of Spider-Man get to his head and become an asshole. I should probably mention he was still dating Mary Jane when that happened. The Venom symbiote crash lands to Earth and attaches itself to Peter Parker, turning him into an even bigger asshole and also causing the cringiest scene in Spider-Man film history. It's so bad. It's so bad. Seriously, how did this make the final cut? That's what I keep asking myself. Despite being absolutely terrible, somehow the film wasn't completely panned and the film still ended up grossing over $890 million worldwide. Even Sam Raimi hated the film, telling the Nerdist podcast it wasn't just a bad film, but awful. I remember thinking this film was bad when I first saw it, but on rewatching it, it is seriously worse than I remembered. Thanks to its success, a fourth film went under development, again with Raimi at the helm. From 2007 to 2009, multiple scripts were drafted with Sam Raimi wanting to showcase the lizard this time around. John Malkovich was rumored to portray the Vulture, with Anne Hathaway rumored to be in negotiations to play Felicia Hardy, who, according to rumors, instead of becoming the Black Cat, would become a new villain named the Vultress. However, after years of development, Sam Raimi couldn't find a story that he liked. In an interview with Vulture, he stated, I was very unhappy with Spider-Man 3, and I wanted to make Spider-Man 4 to end on a very high note. The best Spider-Man of them all. But I couldn't get the script together in time due to my own failings, and as I said to Sony, I don't want to make a movie that is less than great, so I think we shouldn't make this picture. Go ahead with your reboot which you've been planning anyway. And with that, Sam Raimi was off of the project, and Sony was in the works on a new Spider-Man reboot. The Amazing Spider-Man. Spider-Man 4 was cancelled in 2010, and right away, pre-production began on The Amazing Spider-Man. This time around, the same production team from the previous films was still attached with James Vanderbilt, Alvin Sargent, and Steve Kloves writing the screenplay. Mark Webb, who had directed 500 Days of Summer, was set as the director, and Andrew Garfield was set to play the titular role. And with a name like Webb, you know it was his destiny. In the reboot, Gwen Stacy, portrayed by Emma Stone, is set as Peter Parker's love interest instead of Mary Jane. Additionally, Peter Parker's web shooters aren't biological, like in the prior films, but rather something he invents more akin to the comics. Amazing Spider-Man once again portrays the origin story of Peter Parker, but now utilizes Dr. Kirk Connors as the primary antagonist. Similar to Norman Osborn from Spider-Man 1, Dr. Connors is pressured into prematurely taking an experimental drug on himself, which transforms him into the Lizard and giving him homicidal tendencies. The film culminates in Spidey facing off against the Lizard and Gwen Stacy's father being killed, who warns Peter Parker not to date his daughter as he doesn't want her mixed up in the danger Peter's Spider-Man persona could cause. So I want you to promise me something, okay? Leave Gwen out of it. Peter, who's been dating Gwen up to this point, breaks up with her but resolves that he may not be able to keep that promise. Like the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films, The Amazing Spider-Man was a major success for Sony, earning over $750 million worldwide. While the film wasn't as well regarded or fondly remembered as Sam Raimi's first outing with Spider-Man, it still had an overall positive reception. As such, a sequel was put in motion with the intention of making this reboot a trilogy. Not only this, but an entire universe was in the works, with the chief of Sony Pictures Entertainment stating, We do very much have the ambition about creating a bigger universe around Spider-Man, there are a number of scripts in the work, with one of these being a Venom spin-off and another being The Sinister Six. Mark Webb and the cast of The Amazing Spider-Man immediately went to work on the sequel, with several signing on for an additional film as well. 
The Amazing Spider-Man 2 then released to the theaters in 2014 to mixed reviews. Once again, the ante was upped with multiple villains. This time, Electro is the headliner after Max Dillon is thrown into a freak accident. A number of misunderstandings after gaining his new powers radicalizes him into becoming a villain. Peter Parker is on the hunt for his parents, and by a seriously random assortment of clues, somehow pieces together that they have a hidden hideout at an abandoned subway station by putting a coin into a defunct meter. What? Peter Parker, as Spidey, turns down Harry Osborn's request for his blood, which Harry believes can save his life, after discovering it only works on Peter's own DNA, causing Harry to go mad, take spider venom anyways, and transform into the Green Goblin and a homicidal maniac. I think there's a trend here. With the film's subpar reception, which was somehow more panned than Spider-Man 3, because people are crazy, and the fact it was the lowest performing Spider-Man film yet, even though it grossed over $700 million worldwide, Amazing Spider-Man 3 was initially pushed back to 2018, and was then cancelled after the announcement of yet another Spider-Man franchise, this time being produced by Marvel Studios. Under Roos! Nice job, kid. Just... Hey everyone. Good job. As early as 2014, Sony and Marvel had begun negotiating to finally get Spider-Man into the MCU with his introduction into the film Captain America Civil War. According to the Russo brothers, it was a very long process, the kind of thing we had to lobby for for months. They also stated it was incredibly important to them someone was cast who was actually around high school age, with the then 19-year-old Tom Holland getting the role. During the filming of Civil War, Spider-Man Homecoming's director, John Watts, visited the set during Spider-Man's scenes in order to get a sense of how to portray Spider-Man in the upcoming MCU solo Spider-Man film. John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein were set to write the screenplay, and purposefully wrote the film and character to be different from all the previous Spider-Man films. As there had already been multiple origin films in a short span of time, they decided people already knew Spider-Man's origins and that story didn't need to be told. Instead, they set out to focus on the high school aspect of the film, focusing on Peter Parker as an adolescent who's been given these powers. Okay, there's Captain America, Iron Man, Black Widow. Whoa, who's that new guy? Oh, that's me, I gotta go, I gotta go. Hey everyone. It was the most amazing thing that's ever happened. So Mrs. Rogue was like, hey Andrews! And I just sort of flipped in and I stole Cap Shield and I was like, hey, what's up everybody? And then Hey, just a second! Coming! The Vulture was chosen to be the main villain for Homecoming, and Peter Parker is torn between his high school obligations and love life, and his obligation as Spidey to protect people and try to impress the Avengers. It's also hands down the best Spider-Man film. Not that what I'm wearing gives away my bias or anything like that. Finally, at the time of making this video, Spider-Man's final appearance so far has been in the Avengers Infinity War with what's the most emotionally charged scene of the film. I don't wanna go, I don't wanna go, sir, please. Please, I don't wanna go, I don't wanna go. So what's next for our favorite web crawling superhero? Nothing. He's dead. The sequel to Spider-Man Homecoming is in the works, announced to be Spider-Man Far From Home and set to release in 2019. Meanwhile, he's also set to appear in the Avengers 4, which at the moment is clouded in mystery. Sony's just now releasing a film based on Venom, with Tom Hardy portraying Eddie Brock, who's had the symbiote attached to him. So there you have a long and storied history of Spider-Man films. I hope you enjoyed watching this as much as I enjoyed researching and writing it. And before I go, I'll leave you with one final moment to remember our beloved hero by. Nope, sorry, wrong clip. Let us know in the comments below what your favorite Spider-Man film was. And if you actually enjoyed Spider-Man 3, fight me to the death in a wrestling match for $500. That was a reference to Spider-Man 1. See you guys next time. Peace.